to the comic shop I'll let you read about Cyclops I'll have you spending all you got Cyberfog is looking hot Uncle B What up everybody? Legit back in the house, ready to talk to you about another comic book that was totally awesome in the 1990s. Today we've got this absolutely beautiful gem right here. The New Mutants number 87. This is the first appearance on my boy Cable. Right there, and this is actually the second printing. You can tell this is the second printing because it has a gold background, not an orange background. When I was a kid, the first printing of this guy was up to like 80 bucks thanks to the speculative market. $80 for this bad boy, like the, the first printing. The second printing never really did much anything. It was just there so we could all pick one up and find out. Pretty cool, this is actually drawn by Rob Liefeld and inked by Todd McFarlane. How about that? Two guys that would later go, and boom, right there, right there, we've got Fabio. I mean, this comic's already the best ever made because Fabio's in it, promoting Iron Sword, Wizards and Warriors 2 for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Let me just go ahead and do a Lord Alfred Hayes, like for all of you who remember the WWF back in the day. The evil wizard Malkil is back, and his fury rages out of control in the form of four sinister elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. As Kuros, the night warrior, you track them in the dark domains, pursued by armies of vile creatures. To emerge victorious, assemble the shattered Iron Sword, and face what no warrior has ever faced before. Iron Sword, Wizards and Warriors 2, by acclaim for the Nintendo Entertainment System. Okay, so anyways, then we go to a show of power here. This is uh, the Mutant Liberation Front, and this is actually really cool. I know that SJWs in the industry will really appreciate that Luis Simonson and Rob Liefeld took the time to create a, a character who was a bigger girl. I appreciated that as a kid. The Mutant Liberation Front at this time was Reaper, who I always thought looked awesome. Wildside, who I thought looked really, really awesome. Strobe, who can burn her way through almost anything. Forearm, with, of course, forearms. Tempo, who can make time fly with her. I didn't quite get what the bucket head was all about, um, but it's, it's kind of cool. And then the incredible shrinking Thumbelina. So, you know, you make the big girl into the tiny girl. It's kind of cool. So basically, you know, like they're they're basically like breaking into, you know, this uh, this energy research station with the most deadly purpose. And you get this great, you know, fighting's going on here. Lots of fighting. Dungeons and Dragons. There's a lot of fantasy stuff going on in in here. Um, and then Cable shows up. There he is for the first time. There you see him. And basically, they're trying to, you know, take this thing down. Zero comes in, opens up a portal to get him out of here. And Cable shows up. There's a huge explosion, but Cable doesn't give a crap because he's unstoppable. And then we go to Asgard, where the new mutants, some of the new mutants have been, like, trapped, essentially. And they, they then get, you know, luckily, they get a, a map out, and so they're able to take all these back ways to finally escape Asgard and return to Midgard, which you and I refer to as, as Earth. And uh, here's a chick that you think is Boom Boom, but it's not Boom Boom. And unfortunately, you know, it's like, I basically would have had to have read issue 85 and 86, I think, to make sense of this because Louise Simonson does not explain exactly what has happened and what is going on in this comic. So reading it now, 20 years later, uh, it just kind of left me confused. Uh, basically, these two are a couple muties who are in the hospital and blah, 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 blah. This comic is, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But there we have Strife. And, I mean, I, I pop for Strife. I pop for Strife. I can sit here. I can just sit here and look at this picture. It doesn't matter if this comic is good or bad. Uh, it doesn't matter that the, the robot guy, who I never got and I thought was kind of stupid, he looks kind of cool. Like, I like the yellow and black scheme, and I kind of like the face. He reminds me of Slapstick, which was a short-lived character in the Marvel Universe, but that's what he always reminded me of. Now, of course, I knew who Slapstick was before I knew who this idiot was. And he's going to die later in the New Mutants. It's going to be very sad for people, but I didn't really care. 
Because when I was a kid, I just wanted an outfit like this so I could vanquish my enemies. You know, you grow up, you know, you grow up chubby like Thumbelina and you get picked on a lot. And so all you want to do is grow up to be strife and teach those bastards a lesson. So basically, you know, Cable's hunting down the Mutant Liberation Front. You know, I loved Boom Boom so much. I loved the way she was dressed. I don't know if this was the way women were actually dressing in 1991. But if they were, I loved it. And I think it was also the blonde hair and uh, something else about her that I liked as a kid. So, you know, these unthinking monsters, the mindless ones, come and they've got to just basically, it's just them escaping from Asgard. Or not, they're not even escaping, they're just getting out of Asgard. And then Cable's hunting down the Mutant Liberation Front, but at no time in this is it actually explained who Cable is, what he wants, what's happening. And you keep going here, you keep going. You know, I loved Zero, thought he was super cool too. The guards come in and they, they, they kill, you know, the one, Rusty. They kill Rusty, and I don't, I don't know why exactly. This comic didn't really explain what the heck was going on beforehand. And basically the new mutants show up to save the day. And this little, this little mutie here, she decides that she's going with the Mutant Liberation Front. And, and then you have, you know, Cannonball in, a, in his crappy outfit, very inferior outfit, and boom, boom. And then you have Cable and he's just like laying here in a military complex outside of Washington and you look like hamburger when you got when we got you cable you're lucky to be alive what's actually kind of cool is back here he gets his hand totally melted off which was actually pretty pretty dope right here dropping pops not a chance and, and, and cable grabs her around the the neck but you know she basically burns through his arm and leaves him like this Calls him Frankenstein. And I'm just like, I don't remember Frankenstein getting a burnt arm, so that didn't make sense to me. But I did think it was cool that it just melted this dude's arm. So basically, go to the end here. Let's go back here. Uh, pretty sophisticated prosthesis you have there. Not government issue, if that's what you're asking. Too bad your hand got slagged. It's metal, Doc. I can make another one. With two paper clips and a screwdriver, right? He's a slippery devil sergeant with a dossier a mile long. Guard him well. And what I didn't understand when reading this now, 20 years later, is who are these guys? How do they know Cable? Because Cable came from the future. But now he's got like all these government workers who know all about him and he has a dossier a mile long. So I'm wondering if maybe all of that was retrofitted to Cable. Um, because this comic, while it did have the first appearance of Cable, it wasn't anything to really write home about. Unfortunately, now Game Boy, how about that? Tattoo, now for you kids out there who don't know, this is pronounced tattoo. So yeah, this comic was uber popular when I was a kid, but to be honest, despite my love of Rob Liefeld, if you people don't know, which you don't know because I have not brought this up, I am a big Rob Liefeld mark. I collect everything Rob Liefeld. I collect comics that just have variant covers that Rob Liefeld published. He didn't even have to draw a picture. He didn't do the pencils, he didn't do the ink. He didn't even letter it. All he had to do was just put his name on it and I would buy it because I just find the evolution of his career, the trajectory of his career is fascinating. And, but this comic, it did move the needle massively, massively. Whenever a comic gets a second printing, like this is a second printing, you know that that comic book was a success. And I, and I guarantee you, if you were to go back and pick up the New Mutants, like number 85 through issue 100, because it stopped with issue 100, and then it became X-Force, which was even cooler, and we'll talk about that in the future. But if you go pick these up, you'll probably have a good time reading them, because I do recall the New Mutants got much, much better once Rob started really getting a run going. You get to issue like 90, 91, 92. You get Deadpool coming in. You get Domino coming in. All these characters that we all now know and love and revere. And this is kind of, you know, where it all starts here with the first appearance of Cable. So tell me what comic book character you were most excited for when they first appeared. In the comments below, don't forget to like, don't forget to subscribe. Every subscription and every like helps me so much. And I appreciate you guys so much for taking the time to listen to me wax philosophical 
on comic books from the 1990s. And just so you know, you can probably pick this up for a buck or two bucks, or I mean, maybe at the most three bucks. And that's if you're at, you know, a pretentious comic book shop. But a good comic book shop, a couple bucks, you'll be able to take this home with you. And you can read the first appearance of Cable. And we'll talk about some more New Mutants, some more X-Men, some more Rob Liefeld in the future. But thanks for listening, guys, and we'll see you next time. Peace.